At Maxar, we turn big ideas into successful missions. Missions that address change on Earth and power exploration into our solar system and beyond. As a partner to innovative businesses and more than 50 governments, we've been building advanced technology since humans first began exploring space. And since we first started looking at Earth from above. Maxar Space Infrastructure Capabilities harness the promise of space for programs like in-space robotics to explore distant surfaces, power and propulsion systems that will push us farther into the galaxy, and communication satellites that provide connectivity across the globe. As a leader in Earth intelligence, Maxar offers situational awareness to protect national security and empower soldiers on the ground. Satellite imagery products sourced from our industry-leading constellation and location analytics that use machine learning and analyst expertise to monitor and detect change. From the images in the navigation app on your phone to the satellites that connects that phone to the internet, Maxar solutions connect Earth and space to make information accessible and insights actionable, all for a better world. Greetings and welcome back to the APSCC 2020 conference series. Uh, today's webinar is Satellite Manufacturing Found New Ways to Grow. Uh, the moderator of the session today is Eddie Cato from HISE. We're also featuring uh, Maxar's Paul Esty, uh, Jim Simpson from Saturn, and Stefan Vesval from Airbus. Uh, today's session is brought to us uh, by Maxar. Uh, we thank them very much for their support. And now on to the session with Eddie. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is APSCC Satellite Manufacturing Panel. Um, I've been moderating this panel probably face-to-face -face, uh, since uh, maybe five or six years ago. Um, this year, uh, first time ever, we have to go to virtual, but we still have good speakers, three of us, uh, um, here to, to, uh, to have some discussions. So uh, people we have are Stefan Vesvel from uh, Airbus, uh, Paul Este from uh, Maxar, and uh, Jim Simpson from uh, Saturn Satellite. Those are three speakers uh, uh, we organized this time. And I'm Eddie Cato from uh, uh, HISA Inc. Consulting Company, and I'm moderating this panel. Um, I think when we talk about satellite manufacturing, it doesn't really necessarily about geo, doesn't necessarily only about um, uh, uh, communication. Of course, this is APSCC, so we'll focus more on the communications, but there are other areas like uh, remote sensing, even a deep space, or those kind of applications uh, when our satellite manufacturers are engaged uh, on an everyday basis for the business. So we may touch those kind of things as well uh, in the context of uh, trying to understand the a, um, whole uh, market situation and where the business goals uh, for the manufacturers. So with that, uh, what I would like to do to start with is to ask uh, each uh, speaker uh, to briefly talk about a couple of things. What I would like to put the questions is one, uh, what is your company doing this year in general? What the uh, actually um, uh, highlights you have uh, is a, new business capture or execution of a project, those kind of things, if you'd like to uh, put on the table uh, to, uh, to let the market know about your activities, that's one thing. And the second thing, uh, and the third thing, a little bit related to markets, second question is, uh, how do you think about the changes you have experienced in the past 10 years about the satellite manufacturing market? And the third point is, what would you expect for the next 10 years about the changes you may see um, in the market? Um, so um, I know if you start talking about uh, it, it takes 30 minutes to, to talk about market uh, situations, but I hope uh, you'd be able to uh, put uh, some uh, brief uh, comments on those things. And, uh, and we will discuss more details later. So 
let's start with uh, Stefan, if you could. Yes, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Eddie, and a uh, pleasure uh, to be with uh, all of you, although uh, uh, virtually, but uh, I think that's, uh, that's the world we are in uh, these days. So a rather special year, uh, as it is for uh, everyone, and uh, I hope that everyone's safe uh, at the moment. A very busy year as well. I think that, uh, first of all, what we have seen is that uh, we have seen a, a very active and uh, dynamic market, although, of course, with some delays uh, due to the pandemic. But uh, uh, for the moment, uh, we have uh, we had recorded quite a healthy uh, number of contract uh, across the business. What most appreciated uh, with uh, this year is also the diversity of these orders. I mean, uh, we have signed contracts for a Eurostar and for uh, OneSat as well. And also we are seeing uh, a restart on our uh, Constellation activities uh, with, uh, uh, with OneWeb. A diversity also through across the different business segments, uh, being through government, uh, as we, we will be building the new uh, Skynet 6 satellites, through TV with uh, the contract that we are doing for ArabSat with Bada 8, and also this important, as I mentioned, uh, OneSat for uh, Optus, and mobility with uh, the contract with uh, Theraya. So very big complementarity between business and also between uh, our products. And that brings to another point uh, on the market at the moment, which is very important, is this cross-fertilization between uh, what we are doing, between what we are doing in LEO, in GEO, and with the flexible satellite. I mean, you, you can't take them as individual offers. You can't take them as competing with each other. They are really complementing uh, each other's. And another point also, it's... Uh, this public crisis is a unique situation. I mean, uh, I mean, hopefully it's going to be unique for some time, but uh, I mean, don't need uh, to expand too much on that. But also a very busy period. I mean, uh, and it's really a credit to our teams being able to launch satellite. We launched uh, NSS2 in July. Managing launch campaign in Florida was uh, quite an experience. Uh, we went through the design review of OneSat exactly during uh, during the, long, the lockdown that we managed with agencies and customers. And we also negotiated and uh, signed contracts. With regards to your two questions, I mean, uh, for, for the last decade, what we have seen is indeed uh, this move and this cross-fertilization that we mentioned about, uh, about uh, between the, the different products going to mass production, going to active antenna, going to flexible satellites, and also through the digitalization. What could we expect from the next 10 years? Uh, we are seeing also an awful lot developing on the uh, optical uh, communication, and uh, we are flying this new teleo uh, optical fiddling on the Arab set. I think that, uh, and what we are doing on EDRS is really a, a head start. A lot of space to space communications uh, through these networks, uh, talking between Leo, Geo, and uh, Mio, and also a full integration of uh, the ground the ground segment with the satellites. I mean, a satellite is not anymore something which is on its own in space. It's really a node for a network. And uh, we really see the satellite uh, as such in, in the way that it needs to be integrated. So quite a, an interesting period. And also, as you mentioned, beyond uh, uh, beyond telecom, an interesting one uh, where we are quite proud of and uh, quite excited about, for instance, is the, everything which is happening with, uh, with the moon, with uh, with Mars, I mean, we also got, uh, we are the prime contractor for the cargo ship for the Mars sample return mission, which is a, a very exciting, uh, a very exciting mission. So an awful lot, uh, an awful lot uh, happening in a very challenging time. So everyone quite under stress, but uh, keep pushing for the business. Thank you, Stefan. Um, let's go to uh, Paul next. Uh, I wanna go with a company name uh, by alphabetical order. James, so just to wait uh, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> that's, good. that's good. Paul, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Eddie, and good morning, everybody. Uh, we too have had a very successful year. Um, as you all know, we've won uh, five satellites from Intelsat, including uh, four C-band satellites, and we'll talk a little bit later about that. Uh, we too recently did a successful launch of uh, BSAT-4B on Ariane 5 from Karoo. Um, it was an interesting campaign given the, the COVID-19 situation, but very well done by Ariana's boss, uh, Max R and Northrop Grumman, which was the co-passenger. That satellite is uh, successfully in orbit and going through its uh, in-orbit testing right now. 
Um, we've emerged as a key player in NASA's Artemis program, which will land the first woman and a man on the moon in 2024. In addition to our uh, power and propulsion element, we're uh, delivering a broad range of services and hardware for the human landing system being developed by Dynetics for NASA, as well as building a robot arm uh, for use on the moon. And we've also won uh, several study contracts by NASA and NOAA, which will put us in a good position to continue to diversify into the US government uh, business. And as you said, Eddie, it, the manufacturing sector is more than just uh, geocommunications these days. There are, there are a wide range of things. As Stefan mentioned, for example, Mars missions, uh, we have uh, uh, a Psyche, which is an adaptation of our 1300 bus to go to an asteroid uh, beyond Mars uh, to investigate it. So uh, we see a lot more uh, of that coming up in the marketplace. Uh, with respect to your question about COVID, um, so far we've been able to operate our factory reasonably efficiently. I'm actually in there today uh, using the mask and all of the necessary uh, safety protocols. Um, and so we've been able to continue to uh, progress our, our programs that are in the manufacturing phase quite well. We've seen a few issues from suppliers, but nothing uh, major that we can't work around. Now, your other questions about the marketplace are very good. Uh, in the last 10 years, we've seen uh, a significant decline in new satellites in the broadcast uh, satellite services sector as people switch from direct home to you know, streaming video, which is not uh, unexpected. But replacing that is a significant increase in use of high throughput satellites, delivering broadband to rural, mobile, and generally disconnected locations. Um, we focused um, on innovating our HDS product line some time ago using uh, QV and KA and KU products. Um, and we started with our first generation over a decade ago. We're now on our third generation of HDS solutions with Jupiter 3, uh, our ultra high density HDS product in construction right now. Um, we've launched approximately a terabit per second of capacity in HDS so far, and there'll be more of that coming online next year. Um, moving on to the next decade, uh, we expect to see this continued diversification of satellite types, uh, small, large, geo, and non-geo, as Stefan pointed out, more of an integrated approach to communications, um, a switch to software-defined satellites pretty much generally. Um, and then we do expect to see adaptation of uh, on-orbit life extension, on-orbit servicing, and eventually on-orbit assembly of modular spacecraft, including uh, fabrication in space. Uh, on-orbit refueling assembly and manufacturing processes are all being demonstrated on our OSAM-1 satellite, which we're building for NASA, which will launch in the mid-2020s. So that, that's gonna be a change in the way that we manufacture satellites overall. So we expect that to be fairly significant. Back to you, Eddie. Thank you, Paul. Finally, Jim, please. Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, um, one of the things that I've noticed from COVID is that although I'm wearing a suit jacket, uh, which is, by the way, the first time I think I have in six months, I'm wearing <laughs> shorts as well. So the COVID thing has changed things dramatically. Uh, um, I think the one actually key is that everybody trying to make sure that we maintain and be safe. Uh, I, uh, it's, it's amazing, I think, that what you've seen and I think what will change the world more and more is that um, you know, talking to a, uh, as a person that traveled probably every week of my uh, adult life, I think as a businessman, uh, I haven't moved more than a 20 mile radius from my house, but it hasn't, uh, it hasn't precluded me from being able to talk all across the world through efforts like what we're talking about with Zoom. And I think there's nothing that ever will replace face-to-face uh, -face discussions. I think that the world has actually dramatically changed because of this and our communication approaches have changed. And uh, because of that, I think that, you know, COVID, you know, obviously it's a devastating disease and a thing that uh, no one wants to have, but it actually, there are some positives as far as the ability to change the ways that we dynamically communicate. And um, I just find it fascinating that uh, there's always a finding a way to be able to make things happen. And, and um, you know, th this is obviously a devastating pandemic, but I think that we'll come out of that actually a little bit stronger because of some of these things. 
Um, it's the, in the world of Saturn, uh, I think last year, actually at APSSC, we announced that uh, we had had one of our first uh, contracts with InterSputnik. Um, that contract went uh, through PDR, um, a little bit beyond that. And unfortunately, from the customer had to go into a pause as their customer did as well. And so um, since that time, what we've been doing is we've been uh, submitting a dramatic amount of uh, proposals. We have 45 active proposals for $2.3 billion worth of business. That's the good news. The bad news is we have 45 active proposals for $2.5 billion. We haven't seen a lot of these activities closing. And I think a lot of that has to do with COVID. Um, you know, one thing that I, I would like to say that's uh, very, very exciting is that um, we recently did sign a contract and um, uh, we will be uh, deploying a satellite uh, in the first quarter of 2023. So um, this is an exciting events and uh, unfortunately I can't say much more than that, but uh, it's, it's very exciting and we're um, we're, uh, we're really pleased with the progress and the confidence that the customer did have with us. Um, going uh, on the next step is that one of the things that uh, both, uh, both the uh, panelists have talked about is what, what has changed in the last 10 years? And I'd say that the, the things that have changed really um, in the geo world is that Leo came into a place and a few billionaires came into place to also do Leo constellations, which dramatically competed against uh, the, um, the geo systems. But it also drove the geo systems to becoming more and more uh, smart and also uh, take advantage of things that I think that they're seeing in the dynamic new space in the Leo world. And those activities are associated with electric propulsion, uh, laser crossheads. Are, um, I, you're starting to see the utilization of consumer electronics. And actually, the, finally, as everybody's talked about so far, creating you know, the software defined um, satellite system that allows the fungibility on orbit. I think that you know one of the things that uh, also that's always been a uh, difficulty for geo satellites and satellites in general is the economics of launch. And what we're seeing more and more with the advent of uh, microelectronics with electric propulsion, a reduction in a lot of the sizes of satellite systems, which allows for a lower cost to launch, which allows for a reduced CapEx for our customers. And you know, actually with performance that was similar to the much larger satellites before. So I, I think that you know, the, the theory of microcosm, the Moore's law, all are really being in in place right now. And I think that those are really some of the key drivers going forward. I think that what also was discussed before was uh, I you're going to see more of a complement between the LEO and the GEO systems. Uh, one thing that uh, that people don't, uh, I, I don't think they think about as much is that um, you have to complete an, a complete ground system for the LEO systems and you know new terminals that have to be low cost, et cetera. The GEO infrastructure exists. And it, with uh, more better economics with the satellite systems, you can actually really exploit that geo system and complement the Leo systems with it. So I, I think there's a lot of uh, activities going on in the future. I think that you're gonna, it's, if you look at the past, there was a dip in the geo world when Leo was announced with Teledesic and uh, Iridium and Skybridge and all of these, and uh, where there was only three satellites, I think, in, in 2003. Um, but they recovered. And I think that you're going to see that same type of recovery, probably not to the 25 that we saw previously, although 25 satellites were deployed or were sold this year. And I think you're going to see it more like in the 15 range. But nevertheless, I think that you'll see a kind of a robust, complementary LEO and GEO's set of infrastructure. Thank you, Jim. I, I think uh, I'd like to a little bit uh, um, um, uh, focus on the geo market uh, discussions first uh, before we address other areas. Uh, so some people already said that, but uh, market, uh, Jim actually said that uh, also, um, that market has not really been uh, dramatically impacted by COVID situation. 
uh, my count also shows that uh, uh, probably a little bit putting aside about the C-band satellites, which is to me, this is a one-time effect and a special, special demand, I would say, uh, um, excluding that kind of thing, but including uh, Boeing's uh, 403B Neo digital satellite, which to me, you know, Neo is a little bit, uh, to me, more closer to uh, uh, Geo in that specific project case, I think, because it's a equatorial Neo. Um, um, uh, I would also agree that this year probably uh, 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 market size will end up with a 15 range, probably, or, or a little bit more than that. So, which means uh, it's a little bit more than last year, in fact, uh, or in general, it's a similar range. So uh, we have not come back to 20 yet, uh, which used to be the case, but looks like we are no longer like seven or eight a year, it's more like 15. So um, demand is stable and uh, a majority of the demand is going to HTS, uh, vast majority, and, uh, and uh, gradually, digital satellite architecture is increasing, like Stefan said, like one sat or Thales or Boeing uh, digital payload program. Um, and this trend that could continue like next four or five years, uh, uh, more increasing the HTS on digital. Is that something what we all agree to or is anyone having a different opinions or views about the market trend uh, like that? Uh, I, I wouldn't really go, go to uh, put any name here. You can freely talk about your opinions. No, I think Eddie, uh, our, our market analysis is very similar to yours. This year's an anomaly, like you said. Um, we believe it's an anomaly. The FCC, you know, allocating yeah. uh, the C-band off of the geocom business. So we've had, you know, a lot of us are involved in that. That may happen in other marketplaces. We don't know what other countries are gonna do with respect to their C-band spectrum. Um, but generally, yeah, we, it's, uh, we're projecting between 10 and 13-ish for the next probably five years. Um, and as you said, switch to HDS, switch to, um, digital payloads, uh, eventually, as Stefan mentioned, optical communications, which will significantly increase the capacity of HDS satellites. We hope that that would be sooner than later, but it's taking some time to develop. So uh, no, we don't it, it, we don't disagree with you. And as, as mentioned earlier, there will be more uh, you know, multi-system applications, LEO, GEO, and MEO, sort of all combined into one communications network both commercially and for governments. When, uh, when our digital satellites are increasing, uh, Paul, uh, you think uh, size of a satellite is, uh, you know, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it's going to be small, but it's not going to be like huge. Like you had used to have like a 20 kilowatt, 25 kilowatt satellite product at right. uh, Maxa. Uh, yeah. Currently a little bit different from that kind of trend. I think we're, you're right. Jim mentioned it earlier. There's more uh, use of microelectronics, more efficient satellites. Uh, so we don't think that we'll do too many, you know, 20 kilowatt satellites anymore. They, they're definitely dropping in power level and in size, um, which is why we, we're developing our Legion class modular architecture geo satellite, which is much smaller than our standard 1300. Is your is the FCC C band satellites, Paul? Uh, are you a new uh, what you call Legion bus, or are still it's a starting hundred bus? No, it's uh, we we've had adapted some of the techniques we're using on our Worldview Legion uh, Earth observation constellation into okay. the geo marketplace. So that's what we call our Legion class of satellite. Is that a very small, like uh, what the gym is marketing right now? Like are you you guys uh, are able to compete in the same market? Uh, like a two to three. Uh, well, there's there's a demand uh, for smaller, smaller than uh, traditional satellites in the geo marketplace. Uh, you know, all the way from the smallest designs like Saturn and, and Astronus, up to our 1300 class and the, and the Eurostar class, etc. Okay. But in between, there is a marketplace there for people that are are really trying to limit um, their capex exposure. And then it, that also plays into one of your other questions, which is, you know, shared launch vehicles and how we do all that. But we'll, we'll delay that discussion later. That's 
sure. a, another interesting facet of the marketplace that Jim was alluding to in terms of launch costs going down. Is there are significant opportunities there. So wh wh where do you think, where do you think about the um, 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 kind of sweet spot of the sizing uh, of the spacecraft in the market? Uh, uh, if you are trying to uh, be efficient, uh, do you have any specific uh, range of the sizing of the satellites that uh, you would see the no. more popular place or it varies? It varies. I think, yeah, I think it varies quite a bit. In fact, you know, I think that you know, with that very high throughput satellites kind of being the center of attention of a lot of customers, you're seeing these terabit satellites that uh, um, you know, are trying to get to $1 million per gigabit. And um, typically that was driven to, by, to uh, have to have a large satellite to do those type of things. But um, what we're seeing now with some of the uh, advents of ASICs and FPGAs, um, we're actually able to I'll call create many v, uh, very high through trying to cover and how much uh, capex do you do you have at that time and i think that the, you know that the portfolio of satellites is going to be much more important i think you know we talked about you know leo mio and geo but i think even in in those different uh, segments of the marketplace you're going to see subsections as well and i think that there's places for micro satellites and the, and the much larger satellites i mean you know one of the things though that i think that's a misnomer is that if you're a small satellite that you have like small capabilities, but even though our satellite is 1,000 kilograms, because of the capabilities of uh, our FPGAs, um, our digital channelized beamform system allows 80 gigabits of performance over about 2 million kilometers squared. So the real difference there is we're not covering a third of the world; we're covering hence a nation, and hence why we're calling it NationSat. But I think that you know it's again it's what the customer's driving to and what they want. What's their economics that they want to have? Uh, what kind of a maturity do they have of the market, et cetera? I think that there's a lot of market aspects that play into how um, we're going to tailor the satellites in the future. I guess uh, um, I guess uh, I don't want to confuse the discussions or complicate the discussions. Uh, I would say, but I guess what I would I would like to know about your feeling is that uh, okay, there are only 15. Ge let's 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 limit the geo for the for the, for a while because that's really. Uh, we are focusing now. So 15 geo satellite market a year and uh, seven or eight geo satellite manufacturers and uh, HTS, non-HTS, analog, uh, digital, or you know, in between uh, size, big, small, very small, you know, um, if everyone has, uh, you know, kind of a products to address to those demands, probably it's not going to be efficient. And then, you know, many people cannot survive because of a cost very high, you know, competition very strong. So do you see any major trend of the market, geo market, where um, you'd like to guide the market or customers, not really waiting for customers to determine what they need? Uh, is that something what you are trying to do? Or you are completely saying still like, uh, well, customer is king, so you would really do whatever customer wants if they want big satellite, big satellite, small, small, you know, maybe a strong, I know, uh, a strong Satan may be a little bit different. Maybe uh, you are focusing on certain market, I believe, but uh, uh, Maxa or Airbus have traditionally have had lots of different spacecraft types and uh, uh, sizing. Uh, what, where, where do you want to really bring uh, your business to uh, be more efficient and uh, profitable and uh, you know, stronger in competitive situation, uh, considering the uh, diversity of the markets. Um, that, that's, I guess, what I, I'm trying to understand here. <laughs> Any comment that you have? I think, Eddie, uh, I think that we have perhaps to move away from this, uh, the traditional uh, discussion on all the time about trying to see this sort of market as a sort of a, fixed by and basically oh guys how many are we around the table how are we going to share that and so on i think that the market is moving on anyway i mean look at the market the market is quite different i mean although nothing major has happened i mean nobody has merged nobody has left the business or and so on 
but everybody has relatively repositioned uh, itself. It, it doesn't look like exactly the same market as it as it used to be. And uh, I think a lot is done also by uh, uh, investment decisions. I mean, uh, we can put our uh, investments in uh, different areas. Not everybody is uh, investing in uh, software-defined uh, uh, satellites. And of course, I mean, when you invest, you want to make sure that there is a return. So of course, on our side, uh, we are pushing uh, uh, we are pushing the one side and uh, to make it a success, and it, and it is successful, and we are seeing definitely a growing demand. But the market has evolved. We shall not also oppose all the market segments all the time. Uh, the demand is diverse. And in any case, when you look at all the market studies, I mean, even your people are predicting a market which, in general, is going to grow over the next 10 years, uh, twice the current size. Yes, of course, video could go down a bit, but each, uh, data is going to explode and so on. So the demand is going to be uh, the demand is going to be diverse. I mean, and we are seeing it uh, when we do it on the Eurostar, when we build a, a Theraya for mobility with uh, the large and foldable, or where, whether we see the growing demand on government uh, as we do. And TV, TV is still a five billion business even in ten years' times. So the demand is still going to be there, and nothing can be geo to do a good TV satellite if you've got a hotspot like we do. Uh, for Hotbird uh, or like what we do for uh, Arabsat. So I think we, the market has changed and the manufacturer's landscape has also uh, relatively evolved. What is very demanding and what is more of a challenge for us in this diverse market is how do you manage investment and how do you focus investments? Because you, you, you don't only have to invest in developing one platform, you have to invest in a platform, you have to invest in the production in series of the one set of new technologies and as well uh, as the Leo. So that's also where the cross fertilization between these uh, developments and the, the synergies are, are very important. I mean, everybody may think that Eurostar, OneSat, or what we do in, D in Leo are different developments. But they've got many and an awful lot in common, and that's really where one sat is uh, is building on. Yes, it's a fully flexible satellite. Yes, it's a software defined satellite, but it's also a satellite product in series, and that's what you need for uh, for the economics. So, I think that really the the landscape is really moving on. So basically, uh, seven or eight uh, manufacturers need to maintain uh, pretty much uh, different types of uh, products. That's that's what you think. Would no, I, I, guess. I also think that uh, just uh, so, sorry, Jim. I'm just going to do no, ten no, seconds. No, 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 please, please. Also, see also how it's shifting also between the commercial and the institutional. I mean, uh, we mentioned about uh, uh, mission to Mars, mission to the moons, where we are all uh, at different levels, heavily involved, and so on. So, I think that we are seeing some evolutions in the general positioning of the landscape. I think there's there's a I, I think what Stephanie what you just hit was the one of the key aspects is that I think Eddie you're you're you know, you've you focused and we've all been focusing on the commercial segment of the marketplace but there's also there's always been a bifurcated market relative to the government market as well as the commercial market which actually have always complemented themselves in fact there's been more of an aggression from the from the government side of the equation to try to use more and more commercial technologies and try to get the benefits of some of that. And what you're trying to, what you see is that, um, and which is I think a good thing is that your products that you had for one marketplace are now still, are still suitable for an, another marketplace. I know that the, for, we always had issues in which the government would always drive much strin more stringent requirements than from a commercial perspective um, and that, there was always, I thought we felt in our irony because our commercial customer doesn't want a failure as badly as the government customer does not want to have a failure. So the, the misinterpretation in my mind was always that the government by putting these additional requirements, somehow we're going to even more dramatically improve the reliability. When in reality, we had a very strong reliability with all the commercial and the government side. So what was my point? My point is that it allows the marketplace not to just be focused on commercial, but actually expand into government places. I think the second aspect, and all of the people have been talking about that as well, is that most of the components are suitable not just for GEO, but for LEO. Um, in, our, in our case, for example, our HiSat, which is uh, effectively um, a hyper-integrated satellite, which is a bus in a box, it allows for, it, it, it came out of the LEO um, businesses. And it's still used for Leo satellite buses, and so therefore, you know, having that kind of that one 
building block that allows you to go uh, into different types of areas is important. Stefan talked about Stefan talked about um, laser comm. That's in all different areas. So I I think you're seeing more and more uh, growth throughout all different markets for these different products. And I think finally. Uh, you're going to start and see the manufacturers probably partner more with the service providers. So you're going to be some, I'll say more of a, I don't know if vertical is the appropriate word, but uh, more of a vertical integration where the manufacturers and the, and the service providers may be partnering on projects. And so that changes the dynamics as well. But, you know, if I look at uh, Airbus, uh, Stefan, uh, you usually don't really uh, sell so many small satellites, right? Uh, for example, uh, kilo, three kilowatt, four kilowatt payload satellite. I have never seen that you are um, proactively competing uh, with the uh, small satellite manufacturers. Um, if uh, I go to Maxa, um, I feel I may be wrong, but I feel that uh, you are not really in the same same direction as Airbus or Thales or Boeing is doing about a fully digital uh, satellite at least now. Uh, Jim, you are not really addressing a bigger satellite right now, you know, um, so you are focusing on certain market. Um, to me, my question is that, uh, is that not one of the areas that you need to focus uh, to really be a sweet spot supplier for certain products or certain range or certain size so that you can have a best cost competitive solution uh, and the days were over so that uh, you'd have to address to all the ranges of the products like, like the market used to do. Uh, is, that, is that not the situation? And, and the, when you are looking at that kind of situation, uh, of course you need to look at commercial and government kind of things in a horizontal way uh, because that's a means for you to be more focusing on the product to uh, uh, improve and polish uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, applications or technology developments or cost uh, management is that not a situation right now? That's why we don't we, we are seeing like a deal geo meal even uh, deep space uh, things are you know more packaged so to speak and interrelated uh, 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 from product management and development and and kind of you know segment I mean uh, dimensions. Uh, is that not a <laughs> understanding uh, that we are seeing in the market? Am, am I wrong or, uh, you know, I, I'm just a little confused about the discussion. Today. There is, Eddie, there's a certain uh, advantage in having multiple product lines, product types, and there's a significant amount of cross fertilization, cross, cross pollinization between a Leo product and a Geo product, at least the way that we're designing it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in our, in our case, in terms of processors, we have processors on, you know, we are using processors on our Ozon project as well as our NASA projects. And so we will port those products over into the geo market uh, as part of our software defined satellite uh, strategy. But, um, you know, we, yes, the, what's, what's interesting is there are many more products today than let's say a decade ago. And we basically had, you know, bent pipe, uh, direct to home satellites, pretty high power devices. Uh, those are, there will be some more of them as pointed out earlier, but those are changing. Um, the Leo products are emerging as, uh, you know, very, very capable devices. Now constellations of course are difficult to put together, but there are aspects of Leo, relatively small constellations, particularly for your government uh, applications, which we're, uh, we are chasing and we will apply those to our commercial pursuits, both in Leo and Geo and Mio. And so, uh, and also as was pointed out, you know, the technology developments in laser comm is a, that's a big one that we all are seeing. And as I mentioned earlier in, uh, in manufacturing techniques, both uh, from a modular standpoint and also from a on orbit manufacturing, which we see as, as key to significantly reducing uh, costs going forward. I think, uh, Eddie, what you're mentioning, uh, it's one of the key evolution for me of the market. I mean, the, the, where we are coming from is that uh, we used to be doing more or less all the same thing, trying to jump on all the same opportunities. And uh, 
and uh, and then everybody was having this discussion about how how it's going on and uh, where is uh, how we are, are we going to rationalize the industry and so on. But actually, the things have moved on in a slightly different ways. I mean, uh, indeed, I mean we are not all positioned in the same way. We are not all jumping on the same thing. So we are all managing our investments uh, in a in a certain way. And uh, I think, and um, myself, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with this diversity. I mean, if somebody wants a three kilowatt satellite and needs a three kilowatt satellite, yes, okay, we, we might not be, be the best guys for it. I mean, we, we cannot be every, everywhere. What I don't want is a, is a market which is polarized of, because I do three kilowatt satellite, I say that the world is going to be three kilowatt satellites and forget about the big. And if I only do the big, I explain, guys, three kilowatt satellites don't make sense. No, the, the market is going to go... Uh, is going to be diverse. And uh, these investments, uh, when you look at the granularity uh, of uh, the steps and so on, software defined satellite, I don't think that everybody is going to be able to jump into it uh, because it's a certain level of investments. It's a certain level of, uh, of commitments. It requires a certain industrial model. So I think that not everybody uh, will be able to go, uh, to go the same way. And I think it's a I think it's good for the industry so that everybody can uh, can understand where it fits and uh, and move on. Yeah, at least for a while, I guess. Um, Maxa has Maxa has geo, deal, large, small. Airbus has those kind of things. Of course, um, I see lots of things that come on in technology, as everyone has been talking about, and uh, uh, looks like there are lots of. Uh, lot more, I should say, uh, uh, compared to before, there are lots more interactions between geo and deal technologies and manufacturing and uh, cost management, program management, those kind of things I feel. Uh, Jim has, uh, as he said by himself, uh, government and uh, commercial and uh, deal and geo under, under the roof. Um, do you think, um, Continuing this kind of situations, um, um, a typical way that the industry has been uh, adopting to design the geo satellites and uh, and and uh, uh, land the programs, maybe more influenced by low cost uh, Leo type way of doing business or running a projects or developing a satellites uh, um, in the future. Uh, uh, and uh, geo cost and uh, schedule, those kind of things will be uh, much more efficient. Uh, like today, a lot of commercial, uh, even government, small deal set are trying to accomplish. Is that a trend, the trend the direction that the industry is seeing today or I'm wrong? Uh, any comment on that? I may. What, what has been very interesting with our Leo experience, I mean, the way that when we embarked on the uh, on the one way program, which really ended up, I mean, of course, uh, we have to deliver a system, but it, it has really been a transformation program for the industry, for our industry. Why? Because we re we really went into the domain of uh, production in series. We went into the domain of uh, standardizations. And we really learned an awful lot and then trying to rethink when we always thought that what we are doing, it's uh, tailor-made, it's unique and so on, on how to rethink uh, our approach uh, to geo. I mean, and, and one set is the real derivative, uh, the derivative of that. So I really, that, that's really first the way that I look uh, into the Leo. It's not so much a question of low cost because the low cost from, comes from the, from the volume. It comes from the, having a big supply chain, having to be, to be able to, uh, to come up uh, with a production in series and so on, which it was very difficult to address when we were in, uh, in our standard uh, geo market. But Leo, we had no choice. I mean, we have to, to build eight satellites uh, uh, per week. So uh, we, you have to, uh, to think production in series. And, and then when you discover that, you say, but okay, I, to do that, I need digitalization. I need this, I need that. And then you rethink, 
but actually I could be using that in geo as well. And then you're bringing it into the geo. And that's, and that's the way that uh, we came up uh, with OneSat. So I think that really this cross fertilization that we've got between the, between these products, although I mean, you can not always link it to some technical features or it's not reusing of hardware directly and so on, but that's the way that uh, it really for us uh, changed the game. I think the uh, Leo constellations have spurred the supply chain that's traditionally fed the geo marketplace on to innovate more than they had in the past and it, including the volume aspects, but I think it's more than just volume. I think uh, you know, parts are getting more and more reliable, even terrestrial parts. And we're going to see more of what I call the 5G terrestrial communication parts applied to space, whether it's Leo, Mio, or Geo. Um, and also the, the large volume production techniques can be adapted to even uh, relatively low volume one-off satellites, which is, you know, we have a, a fairly significant effort in our manufacturing group to basically adapt the large volume techniques back to, you know, the large 1300 satellites, because we will continue to build those for our customers. Okay. Let's talk about uh, on-orbit services a little bit, um, uh, moving on. Um, so, um, yes, Northrop, uh, Northrop did a very good job to, you know, get attention from the, from the world about this, uh, MEV stuff, but no one is following right now, right? Airbus seems to be quiet. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, I heard that you were trying to uh, evaluate the commercial services. Uh, Maxa was in a, in a service uh, to, to attempt, but uh, right now, uh, at least from commercial world, you are no longer there. Um, is this... Uh, life extension or even a large sense of on-orbit services like a debris processing, uh, SSA, uh, on-orbit manufacturing eventually, those kind of things are really uh, tied with any type of spacecraft or is that better to have a certain um, interface or uh, environmental management uh, to, to, to tailor the, the, the uh, technical basis or interfaces, those kind of things, uh, so that satellite manufacturing business and uh, on-orbit servicing business would get better and more intimate way to be um, cooperating and growing. Uh, uh, what's your views about this? Um, um, it's to, to me, uh, on-orbit services is a standalone still in a very early phase of uh, uh, things, uh, you know, promoted by government uh, for technical development kind of things, but commercial dimension of that is not so much well integrated and proceeding. That, that's my feeling, but what, what's your views about that? Well, I think it's it, that market is slow to develop. Um, we are still in that, our OSAM-1 project with NASA is a refueling mission. We will re refuel Landsat 7 once we're launched in the mid-2020s. On that same spacecraft, we do have an on-orbit assembly uh, demonstration of a uh, fairly complicated reflector, as well as 3D printing in space to, to produce a, a boom for a reflector. So it's happening, Eddie. It's not as visible as it was a few years ago with some of the more glamorous projects that were well talked about. Um, but we believe that it, it is a, um, a segment of the marketplace that will uh, grow over time. I don't think it'll get to the point of replacing, uh, you know, satellites in, in total. It'll, it'll slowly evolve, um, much like car servicing evolved over time. And, and you will see at some point line replaceable units for payloads and things like that where you're not replacing the whole satellite, but you're replacing segments of it. That, that will happen over time. And, and we're developing common interfaces to allow that to happen, which we will be offering to our customers in the future. So about this kind of common interface, uh, is that something what the, you think uh, industry would have to coordinate uh, or, or are you are expecting government to do that kind of coordination work? How, how uh, that well, That's a good question. I, I don't know if the government's going to do that. I, I would expect just like commercial electronics that the, the 
commercial industry would develop the, the universal interfaces or you know common interfaces for for things that like we're talking about for power systems for data handling systems etc and uh, satellite manufacturing industry is ready to collaborate with that uh, <laughs> that changes your designs and changes your system a little bit uh, if you not a radical design change from our okay. perspective mm -hmm. okay uh, tend to uh, tend to agree, and uh, I would also well agree with Paul that uh, I mean there, there are definitely an awful lot of opportunities, and we, we will see that business growing. I think that it's a bit of a challenging time for the uh, for the commercial business to get involved, and uh, I, I'm not sure it's their priority at the moment. Uh, I think also that uh, with regards to the life extension, we had a period where there was a bit of a debate where uh, operators were quite keen, I would say, to uh, buy, I would say, another five years to undo and to delay decisions. But really what we are, where we saw a bit of a shift also with, uh, uh, with the operators is that uh, an awful lot of them also actually realized that the best way to prepare for their future, it's not necessarily to extend what was built 20 years ago, but it was actually to accelerate how they move on on, on to the next step, and uh, that's where that's where actually we we really put uh, the focus and the, the accelerator on the development of uh, of the one side because that's the story that they need for their investors to show that they are ready for the uh, next generation and the, and the the next step uh, in the business. But you mentioned an awful lot of, of also other applications, very exciting in terms of uh, SSAs, debris removal, where uh, we are very active as well, but uh, I'm not sure it's going to start from the commercial world mm. in terms of application. Yeah, I, I, I struggle with the economics. Um, I fully understand if a satellite was a billion dollar satellite and you could, um, there was an issue with the propulsion system that you wanted to uh, fix that. But, you know, part of the thing that, that we're starting to see from a philosophical perspective is that people want to take advantage of the latest technologies and how can we, you know, that, that actually there's like fleet replacement and especially in the Leo world on, on a timing type of a situation. And so, I, and also, you know, do you want a satellite that's going to be uh, more than 15 years when technology is continuing to uh, advance? Now, I understand the aspect of maybe switching out line replaceable units, et cetera, but, you know, after a while, if there, I think the, that, the complications of on-orbit servicing um, are are such that I think the jury's still out to a large extent. I think there's some applications, but I, I guess overall, I'm just really have never seen the business case be that substantial. So, isn't it a dream? Like, uh, you know, satellites will be more digital, software-defined basis, DOGO, and uh, so it will be more common, and uh, you can really reconfigure the satellite on orbit, uh, you know, determine to how to use it, you know, you can move around the satellites. And then uh, there must be a certain kind of uh, on-orbit servicing uh, to be associated with uh, those kind of uh, um, uh, applications, like uh, even uh, even uh, looking at the secondary market, third market. So satellites is becoming like an aircraft world where, you know, you know, lease business and secondary market is uh, coming up, you know, so you are, your size of the market is is expanded and you have a better business case. Is that a little bit of a dream too much or well, you have that kind of a, you know, situation? Well, I, I, th I, I, think, I think you've seen, I think you've seen people take advantage of satellites that are, um, you know, at, at almost at the end of life and where they bought them and then uh, provided services at very low prices and things to try to keep that type of business going. Um, I, I, I you know, maybe that, that's, that could be an application for it. Again, I guess that would be driven by what is the economics of being able to use this on-orbit servicing system to, to increase the life. And then is that satellite that you're increasing the life on uh, efficient enough to be able to compete with the new satellite systems when they become on orbit? So I, I, it's, I think there's a, there's a dynamic that has to be evaluated in that regard. Sure, I know all the things has to be profitable in that commercial service. So, you know, that's not easy. I think you caught out. That's the exact term is if it's profitable, <laughs> great. If not, I don't, by the way, I don't think any of our businesses get too excited if it's not. Digitalization of the satellite or optical, whatever, is a means to go a step closer to, towards that kind of thing uh, by eliminating, hey, each satellite is designed every time and uh, built every time. And, uh, you know, it's, it's expensive products. 
you know, quality, schedule, cost, always talk about the same thing. You know, end of the day, nothing happens. I mean, that, that's really the something, uh, uh, something what I thought that industry may be moving toward changes. I mean, that was a kind well, of- I, a, I, I guess I disagree with you, Eddie, is I think that you're starting to see the trends. I mean, there are high throughput satellites on orbit now. There are electric propulsion on orbit now. There is contracts now for on-orbit servicing. I think you're starting to see, I mean, whether it's fully um, gone forward or not is another story, but all the trends that we're talking about are happening. Yeah, and uh, in any case, it's space. I mean, it's space we have to dream. Huh? And uh, yeah. when we look at everything which is happening with the, the moon, with to Mars, I mean, what you can imagine in terms of uh, services to refuel, repair, uh, transfer people whatsoever, transfer back. I mean, uh, there is no boundaries to it. But at the end of the day, I think that uh, Jim is pointing at the right topic, uh, at least for what's happening closer to Earth around the geo. The economics have to work. I mean, uh, there are brilliant ideas, but you just need to make sure that somebody is ready to pay for it. And in the current environment of our uh, customers, it, they can pay for it if it helps their bottom line or if it increases the revenues. Just thinking that somebody's going to pay for it because we feel it's needed is not, unfortunately uh, not sufficient. But uh, but it will grow. No, but we had quite a few issues like that. Just because we thought that it will be it, it will be necessary, people will pay for it, but uh, but they don't. So and then you don't find the economics to uh, to make the investment. So, but it will definitely grow. And uh, you mentioned the SSA and the debris removal and so on. Debris removal is an interesting topic in that respect. I mean, uh, uh, it needs to make sure that uh, it's provisioned in somebody's business plan that at some point you you can pay for it. Otherwise, it's just seen as an additional cost. So, a, as you as you pointed out earlier, launch costs are going down, which provides more opportunity for people to develop new and exciting technologies. So I think, you know, there, there, there is an opportunity and, and there will be more projected to be more and more uh, government investment in space, uh, certainly in the United States, both NASA and the DOD. So we expect to see some significant spin-offs of that activity into the commercial sector so that the economics eventually become uh, reasonable for the, our commercial customers. And, you know, Jim and Stefan are absolutely correct. The commercial business is driven entirely by economics, yeah. not by nice to haves or fancy technologies that, you know, we'd like to apply. That's not how they operate. Well, it looks like we we also we... see, yeah. sorry, sorry. We, we also see the economics also going in the right uh, way to help us to, to push, to innovate and so on. I mean, the, the way that we see how the momentum is developing around the uh, one set and the general dynamic. I mean, even sometimes uh, the most uh, conservative or the people who, uh, everybody is evolving and, and, and looking at the economics and how it works and where the market is going. And then everybody is supporting investments, uh, innovation. So there is definitely a, a way forward. Agreed. Well, it uh, looks like, uh, you know, I prepared more questions, but it looks like time is running out. <laughs> <laughs> That's all the case for the conference, which is <laughs> no exception. So I have to close this uh, session, but uh, to do that, I would like to uh, go around the uh, panelists uh, with the last uh, point. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, you know, non-definitive questions, so sorry. You know, you may, you may have to involve your, you know, uh, non-technical, non-engineering uh, way to way to respond. But uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, you know, I actually asked to begin to begin the panel, you know, uh, what do you think about next 10 years uh, uh, to, to, to be a change to the market? That was one of the questions I threw in the beginning. Now to close this panel, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, what is uh, is uh, the vision that your company has on your satellite manufacturing business? Uh, what kind of things do you want to accomplish eventually? Although you are struggling with the lots of technical developments and uh, restructuring and also a commercial uh, values and profitabilities, of course, those kind of things are probably there, but going over those things, uh, what is your vision? And uh, what the challenge that you need to do to, to, to go a step closer. I mean, that's basically a uh, uh, very short uh, response, uh, hopefully, to save time. But uh, I'm going to just go around and close the panel after that. 
Well, okay, I guess I could start. I mean, uh, we, we see the next 10 years as actually quite an exciting opportunity for satellite manufacturers around the world. Um, as we've talked about the adoption of more modern manufacturing techniques on the ground and ultimately in space is uh, something we see as, as uh, going to happen. Uh, adoption of higher through higher and higher throughput satellites with better onboard processing, including optical op optical communications. Um, we see more and more in the constellation activity going on, both uh, commercially and in the government world, and, and we would expect that trend to actually continue, which then goes to what Stefan has been talking about is space debris. At some point, this industry collectively will need to take care of that issue, and that could be actually a fairly large opportunity for all of us manufacturers. But um, challenges are investment decisions. Which one of these paths do we take uh, going forward? Um, and then the other challenge uh, for a lot of us is, is recruiting to make sure that we get the right people in the right place at the right time, uh, you know, take on all of these challenges. But we see that space is expanding and space is now sexy again. And now and we have seen significant improvement in our ability to get and obtain people. Uh, so uh, that has been a challenge in the last few years, but we see that slowly changing over time in a good place. So if I may, uh, I think in terms of vision and dream, uh, I, I think that we are going to see that uh, actually the the space is becoming is going to become more and more common and obvious for uh, for everyone. Uh, I mean, it's already part of everyday's life uh, when we use uh, navigation systems. Uh, people want to be connected everywhere. They they want uh, planes to be connected uh, when they fly and so on. I mean, only only one. Uh, uh, only satellite will be able to do it. And we just need to make sure that the satellite is not going to be a thing on the side, but it's just going to be completely embedded into whatever communication systems uh, is going to be developed and uh, as, part of a, as part of most of the uh, applications. So it's really going to push us to much more closely uh, with our customers, really work end-to-end -end with them in the, really in how their complete networks are uh, operated and so on. So really seeing an accelerated push for, uh, for innovation. Look at what we have accomplished in the last even five years, I would say, and look where we want to go in the next 10, 20 years. I mean, I, again, uh, we speak of the moon, we speak of Mars and so on. I think that we've got a great uh, way ahead in terms of uh, innovation. Challenging circumstances, challenging times, but uh, with uh, great people and fantastic business. So I, I think that we're kind of at a tipping point, and I, maybe that's not the proper term, but there's so many dynamics going on right now that will shape the next 10 years. We've talked about um, all of the LEO constellations. They really haven't been implemented yet. And so we really haven't seen the impacts associated with the LEO systems and how many of the LEO systems are going to survive. And I think to a certain part, that's going to actually drive a lot of how the, the future is going to look at. And I think that everybody's been talking about, uh, I'll say, uh, more of a uh, more of a, I'll say, an architectural approach, where how do we make sure that geo, meo, leo, and terrestrial components complementarily work together? And how do we make sure that those things fit? I think we talked about economics of launch, which has always been a driver and still is to this day. But we're seeing things like the uh, SpaceX, uh, um, I guess, Satellite Express, where it's two, $2 million dollars for two, uh, 200,000 kilograms. I mean, you're starting to see economics change as far as that's concerned. But, um, and then, you know, you've seen how well can we really take uh, advantage of some of the technologies that are in the consumer areas and apply them to space systems. So I, I, I'd say that we're in a tipping point because there's so many things moving right now and how they converge is really going to drive a lot of the dynamics in the market in the next 10 years. Thank you. I think uh, we are coming to the time and I have to close the panel. Um, there are lot, lots of lots of uh, points that uh, we can talk, uh, different segments, different uh, business models and kind of things. Uh, uh, it's, it's going to be interesting to, to, to see next couple of years to see how the industry is 
uh, sorting out those kind of things toward a certain directions and and uh, charters. Uh, so so probably next year when we reconvene for this panel, uh, in the hopefully in a face to face conference next time, uh, we can probably continue to talk about those kind of things to compare notes about how the situation happened and changed it in a in a one year. So with that. Uh, I would like to thank you to all of you uh, panelists, and uh, it was great discussions. And uh, uh, we'd like to close this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Eddie. you. And, uh, thank you, Paul. Stay all safe. There. Thank you very much, Eddie, and thank you, Jim. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, and thank you, Paul, for your participation and your insights uh, into that panel. And thank you to Maxar for sponsoring that session and for their support for APSCC and for the conference series. Please join us next week for the uh, another session actually on satellite manufacturing. This one brought to you by Hughes. Uh, and this session is the industry impact of flexible satellites. And we'll be featuring speakers from Hughes, from Airbus, from Talis, and uh, also from Argosat. So we look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>